You're not supposed to go grocery shopping when you're hungry. And you know why? Because as you walk in, right front and center, you're going to find all those aisles. You're going to bypass the kind of uh, the stuff that hides in the corners, the, the vegetables, the fruits, uh, the, the uncooked meats in the back, and uh, grains and all those things. That's boring stuff. It's not really appetizing. It requires you to cook that stuff. It's not really packaged. It's just, it's just there. You can make a beeline to the stuff that's already prepared. And you, you're not going to bypass uh, especially the uh, snack aisles and uh, chips and uh, uh, what else, cookies and, and all those packages. I mean, that stuff just looks good to you. And it like, does look pretty. Uh, but as you get closer to it, as you take those packages, if you take the time to read what's on it, uh, you're going to notice things like a bunch of added sugars and trans fats and artificial sweeteners and loads of salt and solidified oils and refined grains and artificial colors and chemical ingredients that you and I cannot even read and pronounce. Now, sure, those ingredients, fake nutrients, they make those foods last. I mean, they can stay fresh for months and years. And those artificial flavors are pleasing to our palate. And those empty calories do give you a quick sense of satisfaction once you consume it. But at what cost? They do raise your bad cholesterol and lower your good HDL. They increase your risk of blood clots and heart attack, clog your arteries, skyrocket your blood sugar and insulin, and contribute to developing a whole bunch of health problems from diabetes to obesity and even cancer. Yet we spend the enormous amounts of money on stuff like that. And as you go to any grocery store, you will see it's front and center and most of the aisles is prepared foods, whether it's snacks or cookies and chips or frozen department prepared meals we spend a lot of money on stuff like that. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? That's the question from the Word of God you just heard a few moments ago. It calls us to reflect on our human tendency to find satisfaction in things that are actually not real. They're artificial. And it's not only about the food, the stuff we consume through our mouths. We crave what we think will bring us happiness, satisfaction, and we want it easy we want it fast. Our cravings devour us because they don't truly satisfy as they supply us merely with artificial stuff that only need, leads to desiring even more. The more we get, the less satisfied we are by it. As we accumulate more stuff, our Anxieties and worries about keeping it and keeping itself, it's safe and protecting it increase. And with that, our list of perceived enemies increases as well. And those who interfere with our unending pursuit of happiness become our rivals and our foes. 
Even friends and family, even they, never mind the neighbors, even they become to be burdened for us with very demands as we see them. No matter how high we stack our money, no matter how much food we heap on our plates, no, ma no matter how many cars in our driveway, we always crave more. On the outside, the packaging, the way that we wrap it up, looks nice. We say, we want our children to have better lives. We want to create better memories and have better marriages and better communities and even better churches. But taking a closer look on the ingredients, on what is going on inside, reveals that our motivations and our desires and the things that we try to look for are loaded with artificial stuff that promises quick and easy fix and satisfaction, but it comes at a high cost to our well-being. Yet we spend enormous amounts of money on it and labor for that which does not satisfy. And at a certain point in the pursuit of trying to get what we want, we make God's will to mirror our desires. Thus, it actually becomes our will in the name of God, but we end up taking him out completely out of the equation. And we end up squandering not only God's gifts, but his goodwill toward us because what he has created for us is not good enough for us. God makes us for each other, but we want to be alone. And more and more often, we want to be freed from the constraints and the expectations of the community, replacing it instead with the artificial social media. We resent our mortality and we invent ways to escape our flesh and we want to defy our aging so that we can become immortal gods. We always want more from God and other people. That's why God tells us, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy. It's a peculiar invitation from God. He says, he who has no money, come buy and eat. Buy without money and without price. How can you buy something if there is no price and you have no money? Well, it begins to make sense when you combine it with the question that we've repeated several times, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? What God is saying is that your money is not good here. He won't take your money. Your money, my money, our own efforts, our desires, our own righteousness, our own vision of what is good for us, our money, we waste it on what looks good on the outside, wrapped in artificial packaging, but is loaded with harmful, even deadly ingredients. We don't bring anything to the table. In fact, we're so spiritually lacking, so ruined by the fall, that there's just nothing for us to bring. We come in poverty and meanness. We come infected, defiled, 
without, within. We're utterly poor. How can we buy what God has to offer? Yet that's what Isaiah says, come and buy, but not with your money. A transaction is taking place. Come and receive the gifts. But the gifts are not free. Somebody has to pay for them. Isaiah wants his readers, you, to know that another has purchased all the good stuff. The food, the water, and wine, and the milk for you. Someone has already provided. The poor have nothing to sell and nothing to bring, so they arrive in their poverty and meanness. And when they come, they find that the transaction has already occurred. For Isaiah, in a guise of a character called the servant, who is previously mentioned in earlier chapters, he says... Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Isaiah teaches us that all of us are poor, even the ones with the money. Remember, those money, our money, are not good. And we need help. And the servant invites us to come. For he has purchased for us a great feast. He will be for us what no one else will be or can be. And that servant's invitation is for everyone. Come, everyone who thirsts. It's for you and for all of them. Everyone, even the wicked, even the selfish, even you, even me. Jesus has paid the price for the rich food. He has purchased what you and I really want and need. The more we demand from Christ, the more of himself he gives to us. We demand a glass of grace. He gives us an ocean of gospel. When we ask for a little plastic cup of forgiveness... He gives us a flood of his righteousness. We, and we ask for just little crumbs of the table of love. He says, I've paid the price for much more than the crumbs. You're the guest of honor at a wedding feast that has no end. Incline your ear and come to Christ. Hear the words of absolution spoken to you that your soul may live. Be reminded of an everlasting covenant that was applied to you when you came to the waters of your baptism. Satisfy your hunger with the very body of Christ and slake your thirst with the true blood of Christ given and shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Amen.